If you're doing a selfie, guess what? Everybody is doing the same. You want to stand out, you have to do a professional. You hire a professional to look professional. Welcome to the Freedom Club podcast. For those of you listening via the podcast, I invite you. You could have watched this live. <laughs> that we're going to have here. Uh, if you were a member of the Freedom Club community. And to become a member of the Freedom Club community, it's very easy. All you got to do is either come to my website, come to my LinkedIn profile, ask me for an invite, or go on Facebook, type in Freedom Club community, you'll find it and join. It's that easy. And we live stream all or as many as we can of my interviews. Sometimes I live stream just some of my solo podcasts. Uh, We have a lot of other exclusive content. We have a webinar coming up on January 30th the Freedom Lifestyle Transformation. It's only open to members of the free Freedom Club community or the premium, yes, paid, Freedom Club Accelerator. So come on, check us out. Thanks for everyone watching this live. And today we have someone who you may know indirectly by seeing my ugly mug on the internet. (laughs) And uh, we have Paolo Ciccone. He is a He's not just a photographer, he's an artist. He's a personal branding photographer. If you, if you watch the video of this, you see the studio behind him, which I've become well acquainted with. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of fun working with him. I think he had some fun working with me as well. Absolutely. And today we're going to talk about personal branding. We're going to talk about headshots. We're going to talk about, you, you share a lot of, of great videos for people to improve their photography using their own iPhone. Right. And we also, I'd love to talk, you know, you and I have, I have, after some of the LinkedIn local, you're based here in Charleston. You, yeah. Your company is Dreamlight Images, by the way. I want to I make sure to say that. Thank you. Um, and after some of the LinkedIn locals, we've sat down for some, some beverages at, at some local institutions and had some talks about Italy. You're, you're, yeah. you, you grew up, you hail from Italy. Yeah. My ancestors are from Italy. <laughs> uh, and just interesting stories about, you know, the differences between Italy and the United States, but also growing up, I say close to the border, but uh, doing some research, there was some disputes about where the border was, right? Uh, oh. uh, some people wanted to, wasn't there a movement that maybe wanted to leave Italy or, or some things like that? Uh, maybe way well, back when, right? Well, uh, you know, the dynamic of uh, a border city is always a little... Uh, Fluid, if you want. No, uh, there was no... So I grew up there in the 70s. Now, this is Trieste, which is the last Italian town before um, now Slovenia. It used to be Yugoslavia. So um, as long as I was there, (laughs) when I was my uh, my early years um, to today, the border was never moved. Um, So the deal is this. During the, the fascist era, part of Slovenia and Croatia was annexed to Italy. Okay. okay. Uh, because those were, you, you, we know that the idea that Mussolini had, he wanted to revive the, the glory of the Roman Empire. And uh, Pula, which is in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Croatia, that's where my mom was born. Ah, okay. Actually has a Roman theater of a certain size. You know? So that is a territory that was in ancient times under the Roman. But, you know, what well, wasn't? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we were in Paris in the Latin Quarter and went around the, the, from our Airbnb and found a Roman amphitheater in, right. in Paris. So, right. yeah. and, and there is there is one in Trieste. The one in Trieste actually disappeared for, <laughs> for some time because it got covered by shops and little... Anyway, in that era, uh, that part of, of Yugoslavia was actually Tanya. My mom and her family, my grandfather from, from that side, they were in, in Croatia. You know, they lived there as Italians. And then when Tito, toward the end of, of, of Second World War, started uh, getting those territories... And a lot of Italians moved away, including my uh, my mom's family. Hmm. After the after the end of the war, so at some point during the, the the war, Tito invaded Trieste and the hills. Then at the end of the war, they finally 
you know, reset the, the, the borders. And from that point on, the borders were set in that way, never, never moved. But there's been always a flow of people from you know, each side of, of the border. Now, mostly were people from Slovenia because Slovenia was part of Yugoslavia, was under a, a, a communist dictatorship, um, a totalitarian state, no freedom, we're talking about freedom. Uh, we, we in, in Trieste, we would see every Saturday and Sunday a huge flow of people coming from Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Bosnia Herzegovina, and coming to Trieste to buy essential goods. We are talking about cafe, make cafe, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, cafe. I'll switch to Italian for a second. So, coffee was. Um, one of the things that they could not find easily in there. Uh, car parts, because the Yugo, you know, the, the, remember the Yugo brand yeah, of car? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the Yugo was actually a knockoff of Fiat. Now, if you have to knock something off, start with a higher <laughs> standard. Uh, the Fiats of that time were not really, uh, you know, quality cars. The Yugo was several notches lower. Below. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing was that the parts were interchangeable. If you, if you broke, uh, I don't know, a passenger door from a Yugo, you could buy the equivalent Fiat piece in Italy, bring oh, it to Yugoslavia, <laughs> and attach it to your car easily, at least fairly easily. So It's like, dri it's like driving Legos. Yeah, and, you know, and the Yugoslavia being the classic communist dictatorship model after the Soviet model, uh, they had their five-year plan of producing things. So if, you, if they didn't have the part that you needed, it was tough. <laughs> yeah, I, rem I remember um, there was a speech that Ronald Reagan gave when he was president, and it was about... There was a joke having to do with it. I don't remember what the joke was, but it was in, in the Soviet Union. There was a 10-year waiting list to get a car. You had to wait 10 years. And those types of stories, you know, and I remember you telling me about the bread, you know, people coming in for bread. I think that certainly many of those stories aren't taught in schools or none yeah. of them are. I think I, I saw, and I'm not someone who sits and rips on millennials or any of that, but there was a recent poll by the Washington Post that two thirds uh -huh. of millennials, and uh -huh. on this I blame schools and parents. I don't sure. think against millennials. Uh, didn't know basic facts about what the Holocaust was, even was, Ouch. and I think a lot of people don't fully realize we have a lot of monuments in this country to various politicians to certain things, but the victims of communism dwarf oh. or two dwarf anything that we've ever seen, and somehow it gets swept under the rug for whatever reason that is. I, I have my ideas on what the reasons are. But. Well, it is true. I mean, the, the, what, what Stalin, the amount of people that Stalin killed is, is staggering. Uh, why, why we don't bring as much attention to that Holocaust? That's to, you know, I don't know what, why. Maybe it is because... I don't think that Stalin had that systematic industrial method of genocide that the Nazis had. His way of killing was more on the, inspired by paranoia and, and political upheaval, and it was done in several, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not a historian, so, you know. <laughs> I'm right, right, right. But of course, uh, the, the horrific part of the Nazi uh, genocide was uh, the systematic approach that they had. It was cold, heartless, and inhumane. And so I think that is one of, one of the things that struck the, 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 the consciousness of our society so much. Everything that happened in Soviet Russia was all often you know, not transparent. It's kind of like what's happening today in North Korea. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and I, I think, and by the way, taking nothing away from the Holocaust and, and disgusting, I, I just, it, you know, it dawns on me too that, that when some of these despots rise again, some of them 
are poo pooed as as not a big deal. And it's like read your history books. Like a you know when right. Hugo Chavez was coming out, there was actually American actors going there and praising him. Uh, and for whatever reason, I think because of political sensitivities may actually mm. be with him and think, well, he would never do what Stalin did. And then we see some of the things that these people do. Um, I don't think people truly know. Although, you know, it, it's funny. So when I was in Italy, you know, my family is from Puglia and we go down there and you see the fountains, this fountain and, and, you know, I'm paraphrasing. I had my Google translate because I, I don't speak Italian well, but you know, it, it's the, it's, it's the same thing that we have in the United States and, and in, in other parts of Europe. But, this fountain brought to you by the wonderful fascist said by, you know, he's got his name on it, every little landmark. And, and when I drive around here and every interchange, you know, highway interchange is named after a state senator uh-huh. and named after a, uh, you know, some, the more things change, the more they. <laughs> well, if you look at some of the monuments in Italy, so there is a, a, a big lighthouse in Trieste where I, where I grew up. Um, it's called the, the, the Victory Lighthouse. And if you look, and you don't have to look very carefully, uh, on the side at the base of, of the lighthouse, there is clearly the mark of an old fascist uh, symbol. You know, it's the, the fascia, the, 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 the bundle of branches with the two axes. It was part of the base of that lighthouse and it's being removed <laughs> but the, the funny thing is that they didn't think about, I don't know, scrubbing it and maybe repainting it. The, the, the mark is still there. The piece is not, but you can see clearly there's kind of like an outline in, in a darker color. So uh, there are many monuments that were built during the fascist era, um, and they've been sanitized in some ways because... I don't think that there are no st- statues. All the statues of Mussolini and, and all the fascist personalities of the time have been taken down, um, as they should. But there are many monuments that are of use today, like a lighthouse yeah. or, or you know, some sort of a government building. No reason to tear them down, but they've been, wherever possible, the old... Uh, marks of the old symbols of the fascist regime have been removed. Still so yeah. I think it's, it's a, you know, the old, I always tell people that it's funny. The word fascist or fascism is used fairly liberally in general to, to label some sort of a regime. Right. You know, when I grew up in Italy, of course, you, you reach a, a certain age, at least in my generation where, um, you know, we were just a few years away from that era. You know, I, I was born in 62. So, you know, it, it's very, yeah. very short interval from 1945 when the war ended. And so you go to school and one day they tell you the story. Wait, what? <laughs> right. right. We, we were what? We were doing, you're kidding me. So, but I, so it's, it's it's a bit of a trauma. It's a bit of a shock, and of course you're feeling ashamed um, of, of that past. I thank God that at least there was no racial program in uh, in Mussolini's program in Mussolini's politics. Um, it always pains me that Italy is put together with, with Germany of that period of time, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the 30s and 40s, because as bad as Mussolini was, and he was bad, uh, there was no racial cleansing as part of his program. There was Hitler. Um, nobody knew. Nobody knew at that time. You know, all the, all the images of the concentration camps and all the horrors that happened um, there, they, they were discovered when the Allies arrived in Germany. So much so that uh, I remember in a documentary I saw recently, they were talking about how uh, the Russians are, found actually the, the first concentration camp, and they started talking about what they found. And people thought that they were making it up. Yeah because the photos were not yet circulating. 
uh, the horror of that scale, it's, it's unfathomable. It's just something you can't imagine. I, th- I think I'm grateful that at least Italy wasn't involved in that. It makes the shame of that past a little more bearable. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. let's go to a lighter subject. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. It's a, it's a, I'm reading a Churchill biography now, and it's, yeah. it's interesting, the machinations that went along. And for years, he, just, he was warning about Stalin. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden, Hitler was there. And he was yeah. like, well, we got to be friends with Stalin now. We'll fight I him know. later. I, I, and everything that Churchill said came to pass. But he was actually making overtures to Italy at, at one point because he thought they were going to fight. And then when Germany just started taking over, boom, com- country after country after country, people were like, I mean, even the French, like, forget it. You know, <laughs> and Chur- you know, if it wasn't for Churchill, it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. No, that was, uh, those were the heroic times. So, you know, starting off with that topic, uh, you know, I usually ask it as the first question. But that was a great lead into this question, which <laughs> is, this is the Freedom Club podcast, and I always ask all my guests, what does the word freedom mean to you? I saw your, your previous episodes, and I, know, <laughs> I knew about this, and, and it made me think. And um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I looked at my past and, 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 and thought about freedom and what I did. I think that for me, freedom means the ability to create. Uh, We have a big brain, this frontal lobe here is all about imagining things. We hear often people saying, oh, I'm a very visual person. Well, we are, all of us are visual people. Um, It is it is vital for us to create. Um, you, you can write, you can uh, paint, photograph, uh, be involved in music, um, or use your creativity to build a new business. Uh, but the constant I see in, in the human thought, in the human nature, is that we are uh, automatically urged to create. And uh, I've been lucky in my life because I come from, uh, from a, a family where my father was a photographer. He's the one who introduced me to that. Um, I went to the Art Institute, so I've been uh, very involved with uh, visual arts. I love music. I play a little bit of guitar. So throughout my life, <clears throat> when, I was, when I was a software engineer, I was... Uh, involved in another creative activity. Writing software is an incredibly creative and artistic um, activity. So all my life has been uh, marked by, characterized by creation. And uh, it's something that excites me. Um, You know, if I find somebody uh, with with a client, like I did for you, um, it's that moment where you start analyzing this person, seeing how they move, uh, you know, like in your case, I, I, like, uh, I like thinking of you as being the, uh, the business coach that gives tough love. You know, that's, that's <laughs> <how I go. laughs> and, and I could tell right away, I mean, that first time you came to, to, to my studio with Thomas, um, and I, I saw you in uh, one of the Charleston leaders groups uh, meetings before, um, but you, you have that aura, you know? And uh, so it's part of my job to get in sync with each person. And so we did your first photo shoot. And I think I, I got you in that, in that uh, demeanor, in that pose and, you know, your, you're a friendly guy, but you're very down to business. So I say, okay, let's. No, <laughs> don't want it to. I don't want it to. I didn't want to make you uh, look like distant or aggressive or you know. But definitely, that tough love, seriousness, business like, is something that is your image, part of your image. And so I try my best to capture it. 
that is a creative moment. And it's exciting. You have to think on, on your feet. You have to take care of all the technical parts uh, related to the camera and connect with the person in front of you because if there is no connection, nothing works. It has to be human, has to be creative. Um, that is the part that excites me. And so freedom, think about this. In Russia, in Soviet Russia, rock and roll was illegal. In Afghanistan, during the Taliban period, TVs were illegal. The first thing that a repressive regime does is to clamp down on creativity. Yeah. Because they are afraid of it. The freedom of creating and expressing yourself is a disruptive force for good. <laughs> and so I think that that, is, for me, freedom is the ability to be creative. Interesting. Yeah, we I certainly, we see poets in, uh, well, poets in Cuba who were yeah. jailed, you're, you know, yeah. China, North Korea. Uh, that's fascinating. So what, we talked, you know, obviously where you grew up in Italy. Yeah. What brought you from Italy to I don't know, was it directly to California or because you worked, you worked, uh, you mentioned software development, you worked in the tech field, but you also did some cool stuff in Hollywood. Uh, You mentioned when we first met your work on one of my favorite, my wife and I is like favorite ever shows. We're still in depression that it's off the air 24 with Jack Bauer. Um, And then, you know, your journey here now into Charleston. So again, it's all about creativity, you know? So I, in the very early of the 80s, we're talking about 81, 82, 83, I got interested in computers. It was the, the beginning of the PC revolution. It really sparked my curiosity. I wanted to understand more about it. In a couple of years, I became a, a software developer. And then a few more years passed, and in the early 90s, I, was, uh, I became sort of an expert on certain programs by a company called Borland. Borland used to make computer languages. We were actually building the languages that developers uh, then used. I loved the company. They had a great culture, and uh, I applied for a position there. They hired me. They moved me, you know, with uh, everything. They did the, the, the legal practice, the, the legal procedure for uh, moving me here legally with a visa. And, uh, and that's, that's where I started working in the U.S. in 94. And it was all about um, wanting to write software of a certain kind that was not available that, at that time in Italy. In Italy, everything was... I don't know, banks and insurances and all that kind of stuff. And like, I didn't want to go in there. <laughs> I wanted to create something uh, more, more for the people. I always liked uh, the connection of technology and people. I think that when, when that kind of meeting happens and we had it with a PC, with things like Lotus 1, 2, 3, the, you know, the very first spreadsheet, um, in, then became the internet revolution, then the web revolution, then now we have the telephones. But it's always the common thread there is uh, technology empowering people. I love that stuff. And so I wanted to be involved in that kind of field. Borland was the company that appealed to me and uh, they moved me and I worked for them up to the point where they started sinking. They, they did, you know, like many co- technology companies, they worked wonders, and then at some point they start hiring idiots and uh, things go downhill. And so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> A uh, common story. Oh my God, how many times have you seen that? Uh, and so I left the company, I started my own company, which was an e-commerce uh, in the motorcycle field, because I could write my entire website and all the back end and everything my, on my own, which I did in 2001. But then I, I started feeling the, the call to the artistic visual part again. And so 
I wanted to become a, a, a cinematographer. I started doing some work with high definition digital cameras back then. And I got a call to work on a, on a program and on a TV pilot in LA. So it was fantastic. I had to be on programs uh, like 24. We were, we were interviewing the people behind the camera. It was a program called Second Unit TV, and we wanted to put the emphasis on the people who are never visible. You know, the people who make the show, cinematographers, um, gaffers, riggers, all the people in special effects, all those uh, lighting technicians, because there is so much artistry that goes on in the show, and often people are not aware. Editing, you know, movie editing, how it happens, what's involved, all that kind of stuff. And this was in 2005 and up to 2008. And um, so I got to, to interview people on the set of 24, on the office, uh, the unit, uh, and several others. It was a fantastic experience. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, pre- that's pretty cool. Do, and do you still do video at all or not really? I love doing it. It's just uh, it's um, doing video at any um, professional level is uh, is such a time uh, black hole that mm-hmm. I can't afford doing it. I love doing it. I love editing, but I can't. I'm all um, concentrated now on photography and uh, even photography. Just editing uh, the images after the photo shoot takes so much time yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, um, I have to be, you know, rational about it. It's something I love to do, but I can't do it right now. Yeah, and I think I think some people may pro- probably guaranteed, uh, just knowing how customers are in any field, don't understand that. Like when they pay, they're not just paying for that hour or hour and a half or two right. hours that they're with you. It's right. everything that goes beyond that. Uh, you know, when I had my agency, I feel people didn't understand. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just the hour I was on the phone with you because every hour phone call I did with you led to another three hours of work. And so... <laughs> exactly. it's, all, it's all the work. So in, in the movies, uh, for example, uh, it's a classic uh, cliche that a movie is created three times. The first time you write it, it's your screenplay. And that's fundamental. The second time you shoot it and the third time you edit it. And even in the last stage... Things can change dramatically. I'm not kidding. You can change a movie from being a, a drama to a comedy just by putting together the sequences in a different way. And some people do it on YouTube just for the fun of it. But timing and connection of scenes is fundamental. So you're telling the same story three times. And hopefully at the end of the process, uh, you end up with a coherent, enjoyable product. But we know that many times that's not the case. And often when you see these movies where they spend like 150, 200, 250 million dollars and they flop at the box office, it is because something happened between these three processes. Think about this. Apocalypse Now? Yeah. Okay, one of the masterpieces of American cinema. Francis Ford Coppola, another Italian, (laughs) <laughs> as, the, as the director and Antonio Storaro another Italian uh, as a cinematographer it took I think three editors 18 months to edit the movie 18, a year and a half after it was shot to put it together in what it is so yes the time that is in post-production is many times much bigger than it is during the shooting time and by the way, as a total aside, yet somewhat related, since we're talking about Italians and productions, I think most people have no idea or did not realize that many of Clint Eastwood's most celebrated westerns were shot in probably what southern Spain. Italy. No, oh, they, were, they were shot. They were shot. Well, but they were directed. They were directed by that. They call them spaghetti. Sergio westerns. Leone. Sergio Leone is the okay. original creator of the spaghetti western, and uh, uh, Lee Van Cleef. Uh, and Clint Eastwood and other faces that became iconic after that time, they made their... Eastwood was uh, 
he did some TV shows uh, up to that point. He really right. became famous after uh, The Good and Bad and the Ugly. Uh, what was it? Uh, for a, uh, Fistful for a, of Dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And those were made by Sergio Leone, Italian uh, director, but shot in Spain for most of it because the landscape could be imagined as being part of, of the American landscape. That's funny. That's yeah. too funny. <laughs> Creativity, freedom. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, you, how did you come from being on the sets of The Office and 24 and The Unit to Charleston and Dreamlight Images? So I spent 22 years in California and I was living in Santa Cruz, which is on the central coast. I did my stint in, uh, in, uh, in L.A., uh, and after that, I thought, you know, this is, this is a lot of fun, but I wanted to do something a little more meaningful hmm. uh, than just being involved in pure entertainment. I love pure entertainment, but for me, um, I was trying to find something that merged artistry and, well, I don't say life change, but meaning. Uh, a little more. I wanted to, to work with people to be more involved directly in the lives of people. And um, after a lot of thinking and, uh, and, and imagining and considering all that speculation, I thought, you know what? Photography. Photography is something I can handle by my own and have a more direct connection with people. And doing portrait photography was uh, where I saw uh, creating some meaning to it. And I started in California, I was, uh, but, but then we wanted to, you know, my wife and I, we wanted to uh, buy a house, which in California is very difficult uh, because the prices are beyond shameless. And, um, and we have family here. We were actually, we had been visiting Charleston for the past 10 years uh, my sister-in-law lives, lives here. So uh, we have a, quite a bit of a family in Charleston. It became a, a, a no-brainer at some point. We said, wait, let's re rejoin the family, buy ourselves a nice house in a beautiful, beautiful spot that yeah. is Charleston. And uh, in 2016, uh, we did it. It was actually on January, uh, in February 1st, it will be exactly... Three years since we landed uh, for oh, wow. good in Charleston. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Actually, I'm looking here at some people who are viewing, and, and I know you did some of their, their headshots. Uh, I know Matt Hampton you did. Yeah. Um, but also some, uh, you know, do you have a, because there's some people I know are local. Yeah. And then I'll see their headshot, or I'll see all of a sudden they have a new headshot on LinkedIn. Uh -huh. And I can just from having gone through the process with you, that's a, that's a Paolo. That's a Dreamlight Images headshot. Thank you. Do you find that you have a specific signature style of headshot versus what you see from others? Interesting question. Um, I try. I have my own interpretation. I had some influences from other master photographers. Well, you, you've been through the process, so you know that I take my time. I think if there is one characteristic of my method is that I don't, I don't sit my subject on a stool, hey, here, smile, click. Um, I try to create a connection, and creating that connection takes time because I have to know you, I have to make a connection between the two of us. I have to guide my client to uh, forget about the camera and, and be genuine. If we look at LinkedIn, okay, so we're gonna do LinkedIn local pretty soon. So let's go to, link, uh, to, to LinkedIn. Many of the, of the portraits there, uh, of the headshots that I see, are what I call glorified passport photos. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes and, I call them I call them hostage photos. It's, it's, <laughs> it's almost like you know terrorists send the photo and say we you know send us a million dollars we have your we have your brother or something you know. <laughs> well, if you look at the at the original uh, headshot of Matt Hampton, 
he was right there because those are are made uh, kind of an assembly chain. Uh, six, seven minutes. Look, I, I, I received calls from people who went through uh, a bad headshot experience and they call me, they say, hey, I just spent uh, 90 bucks for my headshot um, and, and I hate it. I said, well, okay, you know, you get what you paid for. <laughs> and, and, and so but it was 90 bucks. I said, look, how long is that headshot going to stay on your LinkedIn profile? Let's say that it's going to stay there for two years. I, we know there will be five, but let's yeah. be on the conservative side. Two years. Okay, that's 365 days, 24 hours a day that that headshot is advertising you. You know how long, how much money is that? It's pennies. So are you really not that committed to your business that you want to present yourself professionally for a few pennies a day? It's like, let's, let, you talk about in your tough love kind of situation. Uh, like I remember it was the interview with Claire yeah. for, for her planning. Yeah. I think you said, look, if you don't understand the difference between investing in your business versus an expense, then you have to reconsider how you're running your business. Right. right. Absolutely right. And so uh, the, 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 the massively, uh, the, the, the assembly chain headshot is not going to help you. you know? And what I want to do is to create a connection, to make you create a connection with a viewer, because when you have that, then um, everything else is less important. But unfortunately, a lot of people see their uh, profile picture as an ID. Nobody cares about an ID photo. People, you have to come up with a personality. And personality takes time. 80% of what I do is psychology and 20% is photographic craft. And you've been through the process, you know it. I'm there, I'm cracking jokes, I'm saying something inane. Uh, I'll, I'll make you move, we change, right? Let's change <laughs> wardrobe. It's all about regaining that humanity that will make you connect through the, the, your portrait. And, and it's not, a, you know, <laughs> the, right, the past right. portfolio. It's just, it makes no sense to have an ID card in your LinkedIn profile. And, you know, going back to what you said about you get what you pay for and, and certain people, and I'm sure you, you deal with this. And, I, and I've talked to a number of people in different fields, people mm -hmm. who, are, who sell right. tailored clothing to fellow coaches, to you, to others. And, you know, there's willingness to pay and there's ability to pay. And right. often the people with the greatest ability to pay aren't willing, for whatever reason, out of fear, out of... Um, uh, they just don't, oh, they don't realize you get what you pay for. Or, you know, back when I was in the PR and ad, we, we, we stopped doing websites. You know, at one point we did websites. It, okay. was, it, was, it was almost impossible to recoup our money because an hour after, or a year after the website was up, someone thought, oh, we got to get this fixed, this fixed. And the explosion of cheap website makers out there who would make, Maybe a, a an initial homepage design that looked okay, yeah. But the back end was horrible, and that's where that's where the real power is. And so, you know, I knew firms who would charge five hundred thousand dollars for a website for major corporations, right. and someone would say, "Oh, I can get that done for fifteen hundred bucks." You know, of course, they do it for fifteen hundred bucks. They'd lose their entire CEM, CRM. They'd lose customers, and it and so it 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 always strikes me as I, I get people all the time who say, well, I know entrepreneurs who would never pay that, whether it's my services or someone else's services. I'm like, well, I know right. 10, you just paid 10 times that. And so it's, it's, it's a matter, I guess, of priorities. And, it, and it, just seeing what I know, and I'm sure you deal with this all the time, and just looking at people's headshots. Uh -huh. Now, some people are on LinkedIn to play around. And I say that let me, let me backtrack. There are some people who are on there to play around. There are some people on there who are just for friendly networking. There are others are on there who are trying to get new clients, get a new job. Right. They're in a job right now, but there's a guy, uh, Fabio Marama. 
Okay. He, Other Italians, it looks like. Yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> and he, he's in um, uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Okay. He works at Credit Union there. He's not looking for another job specifically right now, but he's in his 20s and is getting millions of video views to build his personal brand for the future. If he gets let go, if he does this, he provides value to other people. For the people in that latter category of people who are trying to sell themselves, get a new job, I'm sure you run across this all the time. And I run across it while I look, I'm like, oh my gosh, it looks like a hostage photo, or it looks like something that you got at the, in the, in the machine at the mall that spits out like, you know, the photo booth. And I don't think people quite understand the importance of, I mean, just based on the photos that I took with you and that kind of really got me into, there was a speech I gave in Dallas last year and I had talked about superheroes yeah. and I had, I had flown in that day. And so I was changing. I had a, I had a sport coat and I had my white shirt and we had initially done uh, some headshots in my white shirt. Right. And I was like, you know what? I just don't feel, I don't want to put that on. And I had my Captain America shirt. I put that on and I came out and the comments were like, oh my gosh, this is great. I put it up on video. And it, just like that, it became part of my brand. And you and I spoke, I think a month later, I was like, we got we to gotta shoot some of these. It is now, I just got off a call with the speakers bureau and he's like, that's the first thing I noticed. He said his client saw me in a video and said, you got to call this guy. Right. And that's what it is. How often do you struggle with getting people to understand the importance that it's not just a picture, right. it's your brand? Right. Well, and that, and that is why I, I like to advertise my work as personal branding photography and not headshots because the headshots, sure, they can be part of your portfolio and they should absolutely be there. But today we are advertising our services and products online, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, your own three, all, all, all of them. I, I see your posts appearing simultaneously on all three platforms. The same is for everybody else. I mean, for many others. We are adver advertising our business online. Guess what? Everybody, every expert in marketing today will tell you that you have to have a visual presence. Now, how you do it? I mean, if you're not a, a, an expert in photography, how are you going to have that visual presence? That is where you're hiring a personal branding photographer because I can put together a portfolio of uh, 90 images in a session. We take one day and we do your five or six different stories, who you are, your looks, your style, what you are about. We create a, a portfolio of images. Now you have one image per day for the next three months. Now you are different. You're always fresh. You have a visual. It's personal. You're talking to people. People buy from people. We all hear that message all the time. So... That is the smart way of doing business today. Create an image that happens in your stream continuously. If it's not one every day, conceivably one every week, let's talk about that. We can design that part of your personal brand. That is how I see it going in the future. Because in going back to the person you were mentioning, that young guy who's working in a in a company, so he's doing his videos. That is a perfect example. The best time to build your personal brand is when you don't have an urgency to gain money. That right. is where you can absolutely rock it. You have the luxury of refining it, and but you have to you have to be able to understand that the investment you're making in that imagery means that you are not going to be obsessed. We're trying to find an image for Instagram every week or every day, which will end up being some crappy iPhone <laughs> uh, selfie. Look, if you're doing a, a selfie, guess what? Everybody is doing the same. You want to stand out, you have to do a professional. You hire a professional 
to look professional. And that is where I like to help people because we can create that portfolio. We can create that imagery that can tell your story as part of your brand. That's how it is. And by the way, for anyone listening live or watching live, if you have any questions, please type them in yes. and uh, we will we'll answer them. The, you, know, you, you mentioned the uh, oh, two things. People buy from people and we hear that all the time. And uh, you know, Freddie, who was, who was watching here earlier, uh, you know, hey, LinkedIn, <laughs> at, Link, at LinkedIn Local at the last one he brought up, you know, and it was specific to videos. But right. how, you know, I think the question was something like, ah, I'm in a boring industry or something like that. that. <laughs> and, and my view was, you know, and I remember Kirk Vitello uh, spoke up and said, but you're not boring. And people do buy from people and people get to know people. You know, I, there are a number of coaches that I'm really good friends with. Mm -hmm. And we joke around that we're all competitors, but we're not because each of us has our own style. As you mentioned, you mentioned kind of my style and the tough love and some people don't like that. I get some people who get on the phone with me and they're actually worried and scared to get on the phone. Because that's, <laughs> and I'm fine with that. I, you know, I'm fine with that and other, and other people are different. But I think there's, a, there's, well, there are some people who, would, who might be good at video, but they are, they're, no matter what they do, they're, 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 let's face it, they're not going to be good at video. For whatever uh-huh. reason, you know, and I see some people do videos and it looks like a hostage video. Really. <laughs> but you can still build a visual personal brand with a photo. And, Absolutely. you know, there are some weeks where I just don't, I'm not feeling it video wise or I'm traveling a lot and I, I can easily put it up, but I just don't, I'm not feeling it. And I have used, and you see it all the time. I use one of the many headshots we use. I put text on it. I edit it. If you're a great writer, one of the things that I've found, not only with myself, but in others, is, for instance, a LinkedIn article or a blog, the photos that you put within it, the cover photo, is extremely important. And you can still build a personal brand, a visual brand without video by right. using photos. And, it, and if, it's, if, it's a, if that's a start to doing videos, that's a great way to do it. Um, and one thing doesn't exclude the other. You can have your imagery, your, your photos, your portraits, and then have video as well. There are different circumstances, but you're totally, you're completely right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but I remember uh, when Freddie at the last LinkedIn local said, oh, I'm a boring, no, he didn't say I'm a boring person, or, I have a boring business, something like right. that. Yeah. And the point is, I, I think it connects to what you talk about often if I interpret it right, and say, you, you're not your job. You're not defined by who you are. Who are you as a person? Well, Freddie is an engaging person. And we all know that because if you know him, if you met him in person, you don't think for a second that he's a boring person. So the reaction we had there is, look, yeah, there are other people selling insurance and there are other people, in, there are so many people in your uh, in, in your space, but you stand out not only because he's <laughs> towering right. person, uh, but as the person for the personality. So when I meet somebody like Freddie, my suggestion there is yes, let's take that personality and put it in images because the moment people see it, they are immediately engaged. Then you can start the conversation. Um, about what you do, what you're selling, but the, the, the personality and that connection that being connected at the human level, that happens and it can happen with the images. It actually does happen with the images when you're trying to push your business in, uh, online. And that there's no, to me, there is no other way. And, and by the way, we talk about sell, sales. I don't care if you're in a job you love I don't care if you're unemployed. I don't, when I say I don't care, I, I do care about all these things. But what I'm about to say is, you know, people... It's not quite as important as... People, people get offended about everything these days. Oh, you don't care about this. No, <laughs> here's the deal. What I'm saying is whether or not you're employed in a job you love, a nine to five, whether or not you're unemployed, whether or not you have your own business, you are in sales. 
and making that connection is vital because let's face it in this, in this day and age, you may be in a nine to five, you love with a boss who seems wonderful. You could have no job in a week for whatever reason. Absolutely. Um, And I'm going to use this at LinkedIn local and talking about some things because I posted something and some people got so mad at me on LinkedIn, which I actually love because they comment with their anger and it increases the reach and that's fine. You cannot be ignored. That's for sure. (laughs) And it was, it was basically about people who put uh, in their LinkedIn headline, searching for new opportunities, looking for work. In the tagline, in the profile. Yes. Right. Uh, And you commented on this. My post said, listen, I'm not a job search expert, but I'm a marketing expert. I'm a public relations expert. Like, what are you doing? You're providing no value. When people connect with me and I see something in their headline, like searching for new opportunities, looking for work, or some people with their own business who say they're looking for a specific client, they, there's no value there. I don't, and, and some people took it as, again, I don't care about people who are working for work. Some, some people said, I'm mean, and I'm angry about that. I'm trying to help. And I had a boss. You are, point, you are. And they just, they just don't see, they, they don't see the, the surface of the language and, and they don't see the real meaning. And, yeah, and that, it, it, that is the sad part, unfortunately, because I mean, if you I, are yeah, trying to help them and you're trying to give them the real meat of, of, the, of the subject there. And yeah. I'm, and if, I'm, if you just put, if your tagline was looking for clients, <laughs> you know, right. if my tagline was looking for clients, if you're a, if you're a marketer, you know, Apple was looking for people to buy my computer. Really, Steve Jobs is going to build a brand. And so it's what value do you bring? What purpose What's your purpose, but what's your impact you want to make? And right. I, had a, I had a boss. How can you help me? You know, exactly. that's tell me how you can help me. And it what sounds selfish, but it's true. <laughs> well, but, but that is how we grab the attention. So I completely, I feel very strongly about it. I don't just agree with it, but uh, I think that it's, it's a shift that we need to do because if we shift our message towards saying, this is how... So in the case of, of, um, of somebody seeking a job in, a, in an organization is tell me how you're going to help my company achieve the goals that we have with your skills. Right. Once, once I hear that, I don't care for anything else. And I can say that um, with a certain authority because in my first business, I did employ people. So I had a small team. But I was looking for people in office. I was looking for people uh, to, do, to run social media. And uh, I know what, pe- what employers are looking for. I get it. I'm totally with you. I don't care about your resume. Yeah. Tell me how you're going to solve my problems. And the same thing goes for you and the same thing goes for me. There are 900, estimated 900 photographers in Charleston. You know who, where I was this morning at 10 before this meeting? I was at a coffee here in West Ashley meeting another photographer. We just sit down and we talk, just exchanging impressions and ideas. Potentially, you would see uh, that as a competitor. That is what you do. You're, you're talking with other people. You're connecting. Stop thinking about the immediate profit right away. Uh, you never know how this connection is going to, what's going to bring a year from now, six months from now, three years from now, right? whatever that is. But it is about helping other people see things in a certain way. I get, I get um, ideas about uh, uh, how to uh, improve my photography business every time. And the ideas I pick are the ones that uh, I said, oh, this helps me connect better with my potential clients. It's not about, I don't know, creating a, a, a smart piece of advertisement, okay? It's about how can I show to my viewers the value that there is in creating a personal branding um, portfolio? Oh, this is how I can tell the story. Great. And I routinely 
get those ideas from other photographers. With their permission, yeah. I'm not stealing. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, <laughs> it's, I, I had a boss once who used to tell me, and, and it's funny because now I don't wear a suit, but it, I was in a place where he had to wear a suit every day. And, and I remember one day I wore in, I, I wore a sport coat. So it was a little more casual. Uh, you know, this was 15, 18 years ago. It was in Washington, D.C. It was just a different culture than, say, Charleston, right? Right, right. Um, and he said, you know, dress for the job you want, not dress for the job you have. Now, you, okay. can, you can draw conclusions because now I wear superhero shirts, you know, for my job. But, but um, I, I apply the same to, let's say you're in a nine to five. Uh-huh. And I, I, I say that you're in a corporate job you like. Right? right? You're on LinkedIn for a reason, right? And your photo should prepare you not just necessarily for the job you have. Don't just crawl into your bunker and say, I have a job and I'm going to have this job forever. Your photo, but also your headline should be for what you want. I urge people don't put manager of operations. No, what value do you provide? What value do you want to provide someone? <laughs> uh, same with your photo. And, and I think some people, uh, create a photo for the job they have, thinking maybe I'll always have this. I love it, and it's that it's that hostage photo or the you know the 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 photo you know the passport uh, photo, yeah 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 and and, um, uh, and and so I I think that it, same thing with and you mentioned networking and and making connections with people uh, right. uh, you know Eric Eric Kosabuski who just joined you know he just got his uh, his strengths coaching uh, uh, oh. certificate and I love it because I think the more people are in there. I could say, oh, another strengths coach is another competitor for me. No. Uh, mm-hmm. But like you said, it's about creating, you know, the reason you left Hollywood and the tech industry is you wanted to have a, build a craft of meaning and a life of meaning. Right. And I think when you see broader than just the job you're in, uh, the business you have, and I want to hoard it and keep all competitors at bay, that's when you start to get more meaning in what you do. You, you, you have to... You have to uh, to improve your your business or your career uh, from the creative point of view, not the competitive competitive point of view. I strongly believe in that because that brings the best out of people. And again, we're going back to the creativity part, you know, the theme at the beginning that we discussed. So um, again, I'm going to have a meeting with other photographers uh, on the 17th. There is a club. It's called the Charleston photographer lunch club, bunch of people, we are, they are professionals. They're making, their their photography is their living, you know, so as it is mine. And so but we sit down at lunch, we have, we will, we will be at Taco Boy uh, enjoying <laughs> uh, talking shop and, and talking, you know, sharing our experiences. Um, then the way I approach people uh, and the way I, um, I, I put forward uh, what I do. Um, I think it is uh, totally personal, um, and I can connect with some people, and other people might not like my style, personally or visually. Uh, that's okay. There is enough for everybody. And the other thing is, I wanted to go back to what you know, to the nine to five person, because I spent several years of my life in the corporate environment as a software developer. I can guarantee you that there is competition in the workplace. The way you can advance depends on the way you're relating to people, which is funny because in the, in the software, software development uh, field, you have hundreds of people who are in, in a company, could be you know, hundreds of developers who are brilliant, but socially handicapped because they don't have the social graces and the social skills to actually connect with people in a, in a meaningful way. And often there is downright conflict hmm. because developers often want to show how brilliant they are. And they are brilliant people. Otherwise, they could not be doing what they are doing. But that is also their weakness. And there are, I've been in that position where I helped a bunch of people uh, grow in the, in the company where I was growing, uh, where I was working, all of a sudden I was totally bypassed by somebody else who didn't work in that field as much as I did. That was my inability. Uh, my, I didn't care for the 
selling part for making when we are talking selling we are really talking about advertising marketing what you're doing marketing means making people aware of your products your services your career what you have done for the company if you are inside a company and you're working 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 and you're creating miracles but nobody is aware of that then you have no reputation you have no advancement in your career people need to be aware of that and i i failed there and that's why I'm, i'm i'm talking about it now because i know the mistakes i made if i could rewind uh, you know my timeline and go back and visit my past self i would say advertise what you do better stop coding and for one day a week make it your task to let people know the miracles that you're creating in this company um and yet yeah and yes having maybe your channel on uh facebook or youtube or instagram or linkedin can be a way of doing it because if you are if you have something to show without betraying trade secrets of course um but and if you have a presence and if you're showing that you are paying attention to the way you're presenting yourself which is a form of respect for the the viewer and a form of professionalism you don't know what the what the future can open to you it, it, it doesn't matter that you're not an entrepreneur if you're working in a company the way your career shapes up depends on your internal marketing that you're doing and so you'll you'll see that in my opinion uh many many people who work in the corporate environment are um subject to the same uh requirements that we have in enterprise in uh small business in professional field i don't know if it makes sense to you but that's no how- totally 100% 100% well if you're listening to this in the podcast paolo is a member of the freedom club community and so if you're listening to this in a, in a few weeks from now when we're actually taping this you can still join the community come in ask paolo questions comment on the video if you're listening to if you're watching this live in the freedom club community this is going to be archived in there you can ask your questions if you watch this later today tomorrow the next day but paolo other than that when if people want to get in touch with you where is the best place for them to find you uh you can go to my uh website it's uh, dreamlightimages.com uh there is there is a way of connecting me connecting with me there uh, i'm on linkedin as paolo ciccone um yeah it's p a o l o c i c c o n e i know it's italian sorry <laughs> <laughs> um so dreamlightimages.com is probably the easiest way of connecting with me yeah well excellent well it has been a pleasure thanks so much for joining Thank us you. Thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure completely. And uh well, I know I'll see you in person soon, but uh on behalf of the Freedom Club listeners and the Freedom Club community, have a wonderful week. You too. Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>